Oh, good afternoon, everybody, uh, wherever you are. It's rather dreary here in England, um, but I'm absolutely uh, delighted to be part of this uh, webinar. Um, I am the coordinating convener for the, uh, for the um, Institute of Responsible Leadership. And our webinar today is entitled Trust and Responsible Leadership During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Um, I would just like to mention a slight change in proceedings. Um, I will now be speaking about the Institute of Responsible Leadership before our, um, uh, the, division, the Divisional Director of UNITA, Alex Medger, will be uh, then following with a few, a few words. Um, our panel consists of our key speaker, um, Professor Guy Standing, who we're delighted to have with us. And we have Professor Michael Hopkins, Mike Eldon, Dr. Anto Andres Kamala, and Professor Mike Sachs. And so uh, we will be taking some um, questions from the panel and those questions will be responded to at the end of the presentations to make sure that everybody can uh, finish their, uh, you know, their presentations and their responses. And um, I welcome you all to an enjoyable and stimulating uh, event. Now, I am just uh, going to say uh, something about myself and the Institute of Responsible uh, leadership before passing over to, to Alex. Um, I have spent uh, most of my adult life working in various educational settings. Um, I've taught all age ranges, I taught all levels in education. Um, I've worked with in senior leadership positions, with employers, with charity groups, community projects with um, decision makers, etc. And in my experience, the key to success is responsible leadership. And the Institute of Responsible Leadership, and I refer to that as the IRL, uh, was founded in 2018 in response to what we as co-founders were witnessing around the world uh, when things were going wrong with big businesses, with charities, events, and so on. It seemed to stem from irresponsible leadership, and we simply wanted to proactively help to make the world a better place. So, the IRL was formed. It's a not-for-profit organisation. Um, it's sponsored and endorsed by the United Nations, um, UNITAR, the Training and Research uh, Division. And we're very uh, honoured to be part of that and to support the sustainable development goals that, the, you know, that UNITAR have. We believe uh, responsible leadership in both the private and public sector uh, does require all stakeholders to be treated with integrity. And that means that to ensure issues related to sustainability, ethical issues, um, and the, the wider public interest are best served. It's not just about the bottom line, it's not just about hitting targets, but it's about respect and understanding the impact decisions have on others and the environment, on issues relating to equality and the bigger picture, I mean, especially with everything we're witnessing in the world today. So how do we do this? Um, how are we not just a talking shop? Well, we have high quality input and facilitation in the form of seminars. Um, obviously, that's been a bit inhibited with the COVID-19 situation, but we are part of these Zoom webinars. Um, we provide accreditation. Um, we offer mentoring, coaching, researching, and help through our work to enable leaders to share how to make the right decisions at the right times to really instill trust in the people who they are working with. 
And we also enable leaders to reflect on their systems and policies and practices in order to really gain trust in the organisations. And I think that is especially uh, vital today. Um, I would, I will be introducing Professor Guy standing as we move on, but right now I would like to pass over to Alex uh, Medger to um, say some words for us, please. Hello. Hello, Alex. Yes. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, Alex. Yes. yes. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you. Yes, um, I simply wanted to uh, take a, a few seconds uh, to thank you and to thank uh, all of you at the Institute for Responsible Leadership on behalf of the United Nations and particularly of UNITAR. We do appreciate the uh, effort that you are putting together. And just two short ideas that I think are very important is that first, um, this type of debate, uh, this type of analysis is uh, the more crucial uh, during this uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, things are, um, of course, uh, very unprecedented. The leadership, the global leadership, political and non-political has been tested and challenged uh, with this uh, global pandemic. And we went from uh, the issue of uh, public health uh, to issues of uh, social uh, uh, dynamics and more important perhaps to a global economic crisis. So uh, it's, it's an amalgamation of things that are really putting leadership to the test. And I believe uh, on behalf of the UN as I was saying that uh, this should be commended. What you are doing out of London and you have all our support uh, from Geneva, uh, uh, it's uh, indeed unique and it's something that must continue. But the second comment, perhaps, is that um, before the presentation that I have asked uh, uh, Sebastian Hofbauer from my team uh, to deliver, I just want you to think uh, on, on what is really happening with this uh, pandemic from the point of view of the global fight against uh, poverty. We had 820 million people living under the poverty line, uh, depending on how you count, it's around $2 per day. How can you leave, feed yourself and all what you need with $2 per day? But you know, that's a harsh reality. So it's close to a billion human beings living in precarious conditions that are directly affected by the quality of leadership, by the concept of responsible leadership itself. So um, from the point of view of the global fight against uh, poverty, from the point of view of the sustainable development goals that we have, uh, the 17 uh, global agreed um, goals and targets uh, to indeed uh, eliminate poverty, improve health, education, protect the environment and so on and so forth. We see that during the COVID pandemic, things are actually going backwards. And it's a, it's a, it's a pity because the UN had advanced so much during the first phase of the sustainable development roadmap what we call the Millennium Development Goals from 2001 to 2015. And now from 2016 onwards, we were advancing and reducing poverty and improving quality of life around the world. That is no more. And that is no more and it's very sad. It's very sad indeed. And it's something that we must debate on how to protect the advance that we had on this issue of sustainable development on a global basis. And in that sense, I very much appreciate um, and please excuse my pronunciation. I'm, I'm a little uh, on a sick leaf, but I can speak and I will speak um, simply to recognize uh, whoever needs to be recognized. And first and foremost, I need to, to mention Professor Mai Sachs, our colleagues, a member of the UN family, for joining forces with you, Julie. The two of you are indeed uh, the core of the IRL, uh, and I appreciate that. Then, of course, Professor Guy Standing from the University of London who will be perhaps one of the main speakers today. And then two old friends of mine, Professor Michael Hopkins and Professor Mike Eldon, uh, both of them instrumental and also co-founders of the IRL, uh, but also very good friends of the United Nations. Both Mike's, the three Mike's, if I may say, in a more colloquial manner, uh, Dr. Michael Hopkins, Dr. Mike Eldon, and Dr. Mike Sachs, are indeed the type of champions that at the United Nations we admire because we uh, protect 
what must be protected. This fight, again, as I say, for uh, quality justice against discrimination, racism, and uh, especially poverty. And last but not least, uh, also uh, to Dr. Uh, uh, Andre Kammer, uh, my appreciation. She is a quality assurance and program coordinator at uh, globeethics.net, an NGO that we appreciate in Geneva. So with those uh, remarks, uh, Julie, thank you so much uh, for giving me the opportunity. And then if I may, I would like to invite uh, my colleague Sebastian Hovauer from the United Nations to deliver a presentation. Is that okay? Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, thank you, Julie. And thank you also from my side to the IRL and to our expert speakers and of course to all of you participating today. So in the next 10 minutes or so, I will be sharing a short presentation on what has happened so far and give you a very general overview before we move on to the perhaps main segment of today's webinar. So this initial slide that you can see um, tells us in one image how bad the situation has been and also continues to be. So even though in some countries there have been positive developments, uh, the situation globally is still quite severe. And as you know, uh, there are only 193 UN member states, but um, on this slide, you see the number of 216 uh, countries and territories that are being affected uh, by this global pandemic. And this is because in addition to the member states, of course, there are also sovereign territories that have been affected. Um, the red circles represent the number of people um, infected by the disease. The green circles are the number of people cured. And lastly, and unfortunately, white circles represent the number of people deceased. Um, let's go to the next slide to see this data portrayed in a slightly different way. So this slide is here for one main reason. We wanted to highlight the exponential growth of the pandemic. And the chart on the left um, shows this very clearly. And we have reached a very sad milestone of over 8 million um, total cases. And unfortunately, as you will see, the number of cases keeps growing quite aggressively. However, this is the first time um, in our weekly webinar series that we've been doing for uh, since the beginning of April. Uh, we see some evidence of a reduction in the rate of growth of cases. So this is shown by the chart on the right, which maps the new cases over time. And you can see that the number of new cases reported each day has been going down slightly over the last uh, days. And of course, uh, this doesn't mean uh, that the total number of active cases is going down, but it does show that the growth um, may be slowing down. Um, just a, a short disclaimer here, this data, of course, heavily depends on the number of tests undertaken and um, other factors, so the reality could look quite different. And of course, this is something that our colleagues at the WHO here in Geneva are monitoring very closely. Um, on this slide, we simply wanted to put uh, the COVID disease itself a little bit into perspective. On the graph on the right side, you will see that the virus itself is not necessarily one of the most aggressive viruses uh, in terms of mortality and reproduction number. However, um, I invite you to look at the numbers on the left, um, uh, which compare the comp coronavirus to the flu. And you will see that the reproduction rate is considerably higher and around 17% of cases are severe, meaning that they require oxygen. And 5% uh, of cases are critical and require ventilation. And uh, lastly, uh, sadly, the mortality rate is with 4 to 5%, uh, around 50 times higher than that of the seasonal influenza, which sits at around 0.1%. Um, so taking together these numbers, explain the incredible strain that the coronavirus is putting on health systems around the world. Uh, next slide, please. So this graph, uh, moving on, this graph shows you in one image how the economy has been greatly affected by the pandemic. And we have seen um, in real life how this crisis went from the realm of public health to the realm of social and economic impact. In the chart, you see the impact of the crisis on the markets in some of the biggest economies, the US, uh, China, Japan, UK, and also Germany. And in March and April, these markets lost around one third of their value. Uh, next slide, please. So the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, gave us this scenario, and unfortunately, it could turn out to be an optimistic one. Uh, basically, it says that the global GDP growth in the, uh, in the next, in this year, 2020, 
could be around minus 3.5 to minus 4%. So if we compare this to the uh, minus 0.1% uh, that we witnessed during the 20, 2009 global financial crisis, uh, we can clearly see how enormous uh, the impact of the pandemic is on our economies. So at this point, and uh, just a little note that these numbers are of course based on scenarios and that there are significant challenges in preparing, preparing those scenarios. So firstly, the pandemic of course directly affects national institutes that normally supply these data. Secondly, uh, there are often inconsistencies between nations in how data is collected. And thirdly and lastly, it is also a challenge to keep the data up to date, especially in these current circumstances. But uh, the takeaway message perhaps, um, I think is clear that the pandemic has a very real and substantial impact on economies around the world. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in continuing, uh, the IMF predicts under certain assumptions, again, that the global economy could rebound in the next year, in 2021. And of course, uh, this is a very early estimation, but in this scenario, even in uh, 2021, there would be only a partial recovery from the pre-crisis projections. And the cumulative output loss um, based on these projections over 2020 and 2021 combined could be around $9 trillion. And this, of course, is a humongous number. Um, that is not only a number, but it has many faces, many stories and much suffering behind it. So I'm, of course, thinking about uh, the resulting unemployment, hunger crisis, and also significant, uh, other significant uh, societal impacts. Next slide, please. So in these uh, remaining slides, and I think there are around five uh, remaining slides, I will briefly cover public policy measures and lessons learned so far. And uh, I'm quite aware of the time, so we'll accelerate a little bit. Um, as I'm speaking to you from the United Nations, we wanted to highlight uh, what, you what you see written in blue on the left. And that is the need for interagency coordination at the national level and the harmonization at regional and global levels. So that should indeed be a priority now um, more than ever because uh, we believe that the pandemic has clearly shown this, but it is also true um, for other global challenges um, such as climate change or the fight against poverty. And of course, um, it was already mentioned uh, by my director, Mr. Alex Mejia. Um, I think most of you are familiar with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and we believe that its objectives should indeed become the basis for public policy globally. And that is true both for the developing world, but also for so-called developing uh, developed countries. Um, but here, a little note, uh, the progress towards the SDGs and the progress that we have made is quite threatened by this pandemic. And I think uh, now more than ever is the time where we need to work together and the time where we need responsible leadership. So I'm quite happy about the event that we are organizing today. Next slide, please. So this slide simply wants to show that the path to the next normal, if, if there's a, a next normal, indeed um, could consider these five horizons. Firstly, resolve. So this means addressing the immediate challenges uh, stemming from COVID-19. Then resilience, so the ability to bounce back and to bounce back even better. Return, uh, meaning creating detailed plans to return to business um, as the effects of the pandemic become clearer. And then reimagination. Um, to reimagine the next normal and also how to reinvent institutions and also to reinvent the way that we do things. And finally, uh, reform. So being clear about how to shift the regulatory and competitive environments in industry. So indeed, uh, we believe that this is a time for reimagination and for reform. And perhaps it is the time also for more responsible leadership. And with that, um, I will go to the next slide. And there's only two slides remaining. So, as you know, the event today focuses on responsible leadership and it brings together a quite impressive array of experts on leadership and also, of course, in particular, responsible leadership. So in these last two slides, I don't want to go into the details of responsible leadership and how it relates to the current pandemic. Instead, I just want to leave you with a couple of thoughts as we move to the main uh, segment of today's webinar. So 
On this slide, I'll simply read the quote that you see on the right in blue, which I think summarizes uh, this slide quite well. Effective crisis leadership cannot be brought about by simply doing the right thing on the ground. Instead, leaders need to craft a good narrative that helps clarify the problems and unite the population if they are to attain the permissive consensus that is essential to be able to make decisions and formulate policies. So I believe that this quote is extremely relevant uh, today. It was, and actually it, quite, uh, it still is quite fascinating sometimes, even unsettling to see the direct consequences that the responsible or irresponsible leadership uh, is having uh, during this pandemic. And we're seeing this, um, if you're following the, the news, which I trust you do, we're seeing this uh, every single day. Um, so I'm 100% certain that the effects in other areas are as severe or even more severe. So the difference, I believe, uh, with this pandemic is the time scale. The results of uh, bad, irresponsible leadership are felt quite quickly in the pandemic. But that is not necessarily the case with other pressing global issues, um, for example, climate change. Next slide, please. So this is the last slide of my presentation, and I just wanted to, again, remind you of the title of today's webinar, which, of course, is Trust and Responsible Leadership. And we've seen that during times of crises, uh, the public is often looking for clear guidance, for clear messages uh, that are communicated with transparency. And as you will see on the slide, um, if that is lacking, the public may sense deception and uh, effectively reducing the trust in the government and its credibility. And uh, that in turn lessens the ability of the government to implement effective policies that are of course uh, urgently needed. So if you look on the image on the right, it's a quite interesting result from the 2020 Edelman Trust Barometer, which measures a society's trust in different actors. So what is, what is very interesting to see is that no single actor uh, in this survey is seen as both ethical and competent at the same time. So uh, in the chart, um, actors that would be seen as ethical and competent at the same time would of course be in the, in the upper right quadrant of the, of the uh, chart. So to close my presentation, um, I think one message for responsible leaders could be how we can uh, leverage the unique strengths and capability of each of the actors uh, in order to achieve results that have society's best interest at heart. And with that, I thank you on behalf of uh, my director, Alex Mejia, and on behalf of UNITA, and thank you to the IRL and all the distinguished speakers, and of course, most of all, to all the participants uh, for joining us today. Thank you, and back to you, Julie. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Um, and now, without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Guy Standing, who will expand on some of these themes. Uh, Guy is a Professor of Development Studies at the School of Oriental and uh, African Studies, SOAS, and the co-founder of the Basic Income Earth Network. So uh, it's our pleasure, Guy, over to you. But you will need to unmute your microphone. Is it? Thank you. <laughs> Thank no, you. Yeah. <laughs> Can you all hear me? Yes? Yes. I'm unmuted. Okay. Well, thank you very much for asking me to give this address. And I just enjoyed listening to Sebastian and Alex. So I, I'm better informed about UNITAR's own position. I think we are at a critical point in the global transformation. Those of you familiar with Karl Polanyi's great transformation, remember that there was a certain phase of disembeddedness when the economic system was out of control by society. And as long as that lasts, gradually a crisis emerges, uh, characterized by growing inequality and insecurities, until you have a moment where there's a threat of the annihilation of civilization as he put it. No, don't put my slides up, please, uh, until later. Uh, the threat of the annihilation of civilization is a real one, just as it was in the 1930s. And in the 1930s, of course, you did have the emergence of leaders, and they inspired the confidence of their people. But unfortunately, they were fascist leaders, 
leading us into the Holocaust and the Second World War. It's not beyond the realm of possibility that that could be the direction this crisis takes. Now, it's a frightening one, but when you have people like Donald Trump as world leaders, we have to put that on as a possibility, a horrifying fear. But it's also an opportunity for a great transformation, a global transformation, where we usher in a new, more convivial, more egalitarian, more free uh, type of society. And I think one form of leadership that has not been mentioned so far, which is absolutely crucial, is intellectual leadership. Intellectual leadership, which the IRL and UNITAR and other multilateral organizations can foster. And I think it's going to be extremely important in the year or two coming up that we have brave, courageous intellectuals in institutions that are bold enough to abandon old ideologies, abandon old paradigms, and forge a new paradigm. Because there's one thing that any scientist or social scientist understands, which is that you will only replace a paradigm, an old model, when a new one exists uh, ready to take its place. And at the moment, it appears that that is absent in international discourse. The danger is that governments, new leaders, will try to restore the status quo ante, which would be disastrous, an attempt to deal with the crisis in the way they dealt with the crisis of 2008, where within a year they spent the equivalent of the world's annual output trying to put back a system that was in terminal crisis, which were merely increased the bubble, increased inequality, and has created the conditions for the current crisis. And I'll come back to that shortly. I want to begin by recalling what is the economic model that has emerged in the past 40 years. It began in the 1970s with the Montpellerin Society suddenly becoming hegemonic intellectually. And of course, they were represented by political leaders like Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, who gleefully took hold of the new economics, the ideology of the Montpellerin Society to implement their model. And no fewer than eight of the 36 original members of the Mont Pelerin Society went on to receive Nobel Prizes in economics. They became that strong and that dominant in determining what happened in the 1980s up to, the, up to now. And the, the essence of that neoliberalism, as we've all called it, was that they wanted financial liberalization, open economies, the Washington Consensus, and the dismantling of all institutions of social solidarity, because they stood against market forces. They were distortions in the eyes of the neoliberals, and the very institutions which give us our commons, give us our social networks, give us our support systems in times of crisis were dismantled actively, deliberately, systematically, and led by the international financial institutions, as well as the new dominant political class or political leaders. And they led that revolution through the 1980s and the 1990s. And what you saw was, first of all, an incredible financialization. Financial capital has become the tail that wags the dog. So much so that today, or just before the pandemic, a country like the United Kingdom, financial assets equals over 1,000% of GDP. That's incredible by any standards. 
But in Japan, it's 739%. This is before the pandemic. With France, 649%. In Germany, 480%. Italy, 400%. And the United States, 500%. So finance has become the dominant force in the global economic system. And it went with the fact that when they had the Big Bang and opened up the world economy, what effectively happened was the world's labor supply trebled in an instant. But all the two billion people who became part of the global labor market were habituated to have a living standard of a tiny fraction of what existed in OECD countries. And this, of course, put downward pressure on wages in the rich countries, aided by the technological revolution that was taking place, the development of global supply chains, which made the transfer of capital to where costs were lowest. And so we have had a situation, and this is where you can put up that, that first slide, where the proportion, the share of national income all over the world, in the United States, in China, in Britain, in Germany, everywhere, that share has gone down and down. That's part of the crisis, as we'll see, because that meant stagnant wages and an attempt by millions of people to try to maintain a standard of living that their wages couldn't do, which created the basis of a growth of private debt. Now, that situation was coupled by the fact that the neoliberals weren't worried about monopolies. For them, these were what we economists call Schumpeterian monopolies, because they expected that competition would lead to gradual loss of the monopoly power to put up prices and, and, and gain rent. Of course, that was a fatally flawed presumption. Because what has happened is a growing conglomeration, a, a growing concentration of capital in a smaller and smaller number of corporations who have been taking more and more of the rental income within their sectors and have become completely dominant in the world. So what you've seen is a few global corporations taking leadership role and expanding by acquisition, not competition. So the big five tech companies, for example, have bought up 519 medium to large scale corporations in 10 years. So that has enabled them to continue with monopolistic prices. At the same time, the leadership of the corporations have moved to remove any notion of a free market system. And they did it through Geneva. They did it through the World Trade Organization with the passage of TRIPS in 1994. TRIPS, the trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights, introduced a global system based on the American intellectual property rights system, in which Patents and copyright and industrial brands and so on have been passed enabling a single corporation to have a monopolistic profits for 20 years or in the case of pharmaceuticals, 40 years. Very critical for understanding the response with the vaccine or whatever is coming along with response to uh, COVID-19. And this has led to a situation where over 14 million patents are in force at the moment, enabling more and more of the income to go to rentiers. So we have a system of rentier capitalism, which has created what I've called in a new book, which was written just before the pandemic struck, but which I believe shows why this COVID-19 pandemic is going to be much, much worse than the Spanish flu pandemic of exactly 100 years ago. If you look historically at the Spanish flu, 
something like, well, no one's quite sure, but something like 50 million people died in the Spanish flu in 1918 and 19, 1920. But ironically, there was not followed by a global economic slump was quite a quick recovery led by the United States. I don't believe that will happen this time because rentier capitalism has generated eight giants that are blocking our road forward. And we have to confront those eight giants. I draw the analogy of the eight giants from William Beveridge, whose 1942 report set the seal for the post-1945 era of welfare state capitalism, the embedded phase of the great transformation. And his five giants were disease, ignorance, idleness, squalor, and want. We haven't beaten those five giants. The rentier capitalism has created eight modern giants. And I believe this economic slump was a crash waiting to happen, and the pandemic was a trigger to the pandemic slump that we're going to see, just as the shooting of the Archduke in August 1914 was the trigger to the First World War, but was not actually the cause. And that the excess debts and the excess morbidity that will be flowing are going to be far, far worse than the, even the deaths so far from the COVID directly. And the eight giants are, first of all, inequality. Inequality is greater today than at any time in modern history, by far. And it reflects a growth of wealth inequality greater than income inequality. Wealth, which is unearned, but vastly greater than income. Some countries, its wealth has risen to three, four, five hundred percent of national income, and wealth inequality, and measured by the Gini, is much, much greater than income inequality, and therefore more and more of the income is flowing to the wealth holders, the property owners, financial property, physical property, and intellectual property. Inequality creates conditions for the growth of the other giants. The second giant is insecurity. And here, millions and millions of people before the pandemic were facing insecurity, even in the richest part of the world. Millions of people are insecure and facing something that is relatively new and which is uninsurable by social insurance or national insurance as in the post-war era. And that is uncertainty. Unknown unknowns. People feel they could be hit by a shock, a hazard, at any moment, but they don't know where it's coming from. They don't know how to prepare for it. They don't have resilience because this is something out of their control. Insecurity goes with the third giant. The third giant is one of the immediate causes of this pandemic slump we're going to face, and that is the growth of private debt. All over the world, private debt has risen to record levels. In the United States, at the worst time of the depression in the 1930s, at the very worst point, private debt reached 140% of GDP. Before the pandemic hit at the beginning of this year, US private debt was over 150% of GDP, and it's now well above that. It's the same in Britain, it's the same all over the world. Private debt is at a level where if there was even a modest shock, millions more people are going to face destitution, deaths of despair, suicidal tendencies, rising hypertension, cardiac disease, and many of the other symptoms that go with that. And here we are in a situation where, as a result of austerity and other privatization measures, 
many countries have weakened health services and you not only are they unable to respond to the COVID cases, but they're not even able to look after traditional cases. And therefore, many more people are exposed to lack of diagnosis, lack of prognosis, lack of treatment, and will be facing early death. That is the result of a situation that was waiting to happen. And that, of course, is the fourth giant stress we have a global pandemic of stress and stress induces many of those other things that i've just mentioned morbidity and so on and the fifth giant is the one that i've written most about and i wrote a book called the precariat which has been translated into 24 languages and leads to people writing to me every single day and that is the growth of precarity. The precariat has grown. And we have a situation where the precariat is facing a loss of rights. The United Nations talks about leadership and use of rights. But if you're in the precariat every single day, you realize you're losing rights. You're losing social rights. You're losing economic rights. You're losing cultural rights. You're losing civil rights. And that is the real problem for the precariat. The next giant, of course, and the one that leads to a lot of idle gossip is robots, AI and automation. Here I think the images are misleading in the sense that it's extremely disruptive, but it's not going to destroy work. We're going to have plenty of work to do for, for the rest of our lives, certainly, and for many, many generations to come. But automation is enabling the growth of inequality to increase, is disrupting, and by itself has become a perceived threat. The next giant is the giant of our age, which threatens all of us, and has been both a causal factor in this pandemic and the one that is actually the most threatening of all, which of course is the threat of extinction. We need bold new leadership at every level of society to confront this threat of extinction. And I support the Extinction Rebellion 100% because it is an ecological base for this transformation and it goes with the precariat, this growing mass class, who all identify with the ecological threat and want to lead the transformation. And that leads to the eighth giant, where we, every single one of us, have to show some degree of leadership. And that threat is populism and in particular, neo-fascist populism. Today, millions of people are turning to authoritarian leaders, to populists who promised to bring back yesterday, and they play on the insecurities. They play on the stresses. They play on the fears of people, the traumas. And in the showing of leadership, what we have is a very strange phenomenon, which needs to be carefully analyzed by all those who want to provide political and intellectual leadership. Because the new class structure in the world is providing a strange set of alliances, which have to be understood in order for us to have a strategic leadership to overcome the worst of them. The new class structure has at its top a plutocracy, a plutocracy that is made up almost entirely of rent-seeking multi-billionaires. The growth of the plutocracy has been something incredible by any standards. The second slide, if I can put it up, really shows 
how the growth and the number of billionaires, no, no, not that one, never mind. Uh, I'm not doing well with my slides, but the growth in the number of billionaires has been an extraordinary phenomenon. And the number of billionaires who are multi-billionaires. I had the peculiar honor, if you want to put it in inverted commas, of being invited to talk about this subject and the growth of the precariat to the Bilderberg Group in Dresden. The Bilderberg Group consists of billionaires and elite far-right politicians. Uh, you, you know all their names. I wish we didn't, but there they were in Dresden. And I was asked to speak to them. And I thought they would lynch me because basically I was saying, you are the problem. You leaders are the problem. You are taking all the rent. You are exploiting the situation to increase your power and using your power to manipulate politics and corrupt the system. And there in front, literally two meters in front, social distancing wasn't in at the time, there was sitting looking at me like an owl, Henry Kissinger. Here I was talking to Kissinger about the plutocracy and the precariat, and I thought his eyes would pierce me. And there was a multi-billionaire in the audience, and afterwards he said, would you come to California? and speak about these phenomenons to the tech barons who are running all the big tech multinationals. I said, of course, of course. So I ended up being invited to Los Angeles and talking about this subject and saying that they are responsible. And this multi-billionaire who was in the audience, he stood up and came towards me, and he's a big man, and I thought he was going to punch me. And he stormed up to the front, and he said, Guy, are you saying this system is rigged? And I turned to him and I said, yeah, I suppose I'm saying that. And he said, you know, I agree with you. It is rigged in our favor far too much, and it's unsustainable. It's going to lead to social violence. The sans-culottes are going to come with their pitchforks. And you're absolutely right. It is absolutely immoral. It needs proper political leadership. Here is one of the winners saying that. And I saw people, household name people in the audience, nodding, agreeing. They are aware that the system is totally corrupt, but they're not in a position to move to provide the leadership of the precariat. That leadership must come from the precariat. That leadership must come from the young people who are entering the precariat, know what it likes to live a life of insecurity, know that they don't want to go back to the old social democratic model of full-time boring jobs for 30 years or more. They're looking for a politics of paradise. And at the moment, the leaders that are out there are not providing it. So we have Brexit, we have other things which are regressive developments, which are floundering around with lack of vision. And that leads to the last point I want to make this afternoon. I believe the income distribution system of the 20th century has broken down irretrievably. We will not see a rise in real wages. Forget it. We will not see a diminishing, diminishing capacity to earn rents. In that context, we have to find alternative ways of recycling the rentier income to enabling everybody to have basic income security. I believe that the case for a basic income, and I've argued this in my books over many years, is fundamentally an ethical one. It's the only way 
to have common justice, sharing in public wealth. It's the only way to really enhance freedom, show trust in people. And it's the only way to give everybody basic security. I believe this crisis has turned basic income from being an ethical, desirable policy to being an absolutely essential one, an economically essential one, as well as an ethically essential one. And I think even some of the most timid of politicians is coming to realize this essential truth of the following which is that if some groups in society are left economically insecure and vulnerable, then all of us will remain economically and socially and healthily vulnerable. If we leave millions behind in the rescue and reimagination, re whatever you want to call it, with an R on it, if you leave millions without resilience, none of us will have resilience. That leads me to two quotations from Roosevelt. I'm sure you all remember them. Roosevelt said in the height of the Depression, 1932, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. I think he was slightly wrong. We do have things to fear besides fear, but he was right. But we need to make sure our new leaders do not have spaghetti backbones. Too many politicians have told me over the years when I've explained basic income, Guy, I agree with basic income, but I don't know how to give it, come out and support it. Well, now is your moment to show leadership. And the other quotation from Roosevelt is maybe apocryphal. I, I like to believe it. A delegation went to visit him in the White House with a particular policy. And he listened for about 40 minutes, asked questions, listened to what they had to say. And at the end, he said, OK, you've convinced me. Now go out in the streets and force me to do it. That's the sort of leadership we've got to be brave enough to encourage. And that's the sort of leadership people of my generation should not only be encouraging the young to take, but to participate, backing them up, and being there to encourage them if they get demoralized or demotivated. It will require a collective vanguard effort by people in the Bregariat, but I believe it's coming, that energy. And that is leadership from below, and that is the best form of leadership in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Guy Standing, and lots and lots of fantastically stimulating thoughts for us to, to take away and actually act on, because that's the point and the, and the message. I'd now like to please um, ask Professor Michael Hopkins to um, make a presentation and perhaps if any questions to Guy, I will collate and then, um, you know, we can ask at the end or we can, you know, put those forward and perhaps Michael, you could you know, let me know what they are. Okay, thank you. Over to Professor Michael Hopkins. Sorry, just unmuting myself. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, I see a lot of my friends in people listening tonight. And hello. I also saw, saw my son and my daughter there, which is really nice. And uh, I also saw one of my best friends. Oh, that was just before me. His name's Guy Standing. By the way, basic income. the precariat, and so on, are all available. And I encourage you to, to read what, what Guy is, uh, has uh, written and been speaking about for some time. Um, 
One, one concern I had as, as Guy was speaking uh, tonight was I would have liked him to have been a little bit more positive. I mean, the, the eight giants, uh, acceptable, and there are probably many more, but the ninth giant, the solution. And I think that I would have liked to have heard a lot more about that. I know Guy has been um, um, fantastically promoting the idea of, of basic income around the world. And I, I, I totally agree with that, with some differences. We won't go into that right now. But definitely, uh, basic income is needed for, for the underprivileged. And as soon as, as soon as possible, because the distribution of income is getting so, so bad, um, and especially during, during COVID. But on the, on the positive side, uh, what's been happening is, despite all the things that Guy has said, life expectancy has been increasing, except actually in two countries, my country, the United Kingdom, and the United States of America, for reasons that we can go into. Uh, but I've only got a few minutes, and I won't take too much time. But definitely the need for leadership, and I, and I like the idea that, that Guy said um, ab about leadership, um, also from, from our, our, our generation, uh, leadership, um, a progressive leadership to promote things such as, such as basic income and reduce inequality and so on. Um, one thing that I've been working on a lot, and uh, if you can show this slide or maybe I can, I can get it myself. Um, oh, I can't share my screen. Oh, I'm not allowed to share my screen. Okay. Um, one thing that I've, I've been working on, and I'd like to ask Guy about that, is uh, the issue of, of, of corporate social responsibility. I have the impression that Guy would like to see corporations disappear. Certainly, I think, uh, controlling the way they do, the controlling capital that the way they do, uh, that needs to be really looked at. And I think that... Uh, corporate social responsibility is a way, a way ahead. And I think that there are some glimmers of light. Uh, Guy mentioned the Bilderberg meeting where uh, many of the people actually uh, agreed with him. Um, and this, is a, this slide you can see there is an example of uh, sustainability and leadership where it's a, a survey was done quite recently, a week or so ago, by Forbes Forbes magazine of the top 500 CEOs uh, uh, of companies in, in the world. And what was interesting is this idea of moving towards stakeholder capitalism and away, away from shareholder capitalism, away from the maximization of profits and shares, but to talk to all stakeholders and the stakeholders, of course, would include uh, their employees, their internal stakeholders, as well as many of their uh, external stakeholders. And I think that the corporate social responsibility is actually showing the way that, as you can see, that the uh, CEOs of these companies were pretty much in favor of it because that stakeholder ca capitalism would help the acceleration of the move towards this. And then the, the CEOs also said four things um, on the right of my other slide there, is uh, working from home works. Well, I've been doing it for probably 15, 20 years, and I love it, actually. And for me to go to a meeting, get in my car, drive all the way to an office block somewhere and go and talk to somebody or even get on a plane, this is very, very, very tiring. Wonderful that we can do it this way. And I think in the future, there's going to be much more of this. On the other hand, what we do miss is meeting and talking to each other. Right now, I, I, I feel much more comfortable if I was in, in front uh, physically, in front of the 100 people who are now watching so I can get some feeling from you what I'm saying, whether that's interesting to you or not. I can't see you at all, so I, I don't know. Um, on, the, on, the, on the bottom, uh, on the right, you can see that leadership and values do, do, do matter, especially in actions, and we do see that. And the meaning of the word 
essential. Uh, that essential is leadership. And so that's, that's going to be the, fu the future. But I, I would like to ask uh, Guy, as I go into my half an hour speech, I think I've only got a few minutes actually. Um, one issue that has come up is the issue of, of personal responsibility. It's all very well waiting for other people to do all these things. But what about non-violent personal responsibility? And I see one example of that in, in this country, I'm speaking from Kenya, uh, where people are wearing masks and the COVID epidemic is increasing quite rapidly here. They wear their masks, but around their chins, not over their face. Well, their personal responsibility is to, if they are infected, to stop other people getting infected and to wear their masks properly. properly. That's one, one example of responsibility. Okay. But, um, pro Professor Michael Hopkins, um, thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know if you, uh, I, you were going to ask a question. I've got a couple of questions that have come through that perhaps Professor Guy Stanton could ask at the end because some of them are linked. One of them is about personal responsibility. Another one is about who are our responsible leaders at the moment and um, what actions are people taking to make sure that we have trust in our leaders. So perhaps they're things that could be considered. So um, Michael, is that okay if I um, move on now so that we can keep to time? No, of course, I'm sorry, uh, Julie, I was uh, going on a little bit because I was stimulated a lot by what Guy was saying, uh, a brilliant speech as ever. But yeah. okay. perhaps my last question to him would be, would Guy like to get rid of all corporations? Thank you. Okay. We'll take that at the end. Okay, thank you. Um, I wonder if we could now uh, introduce um, Mike Eldon. Is Mike Eldon there? I can't see Mike on the screen. No. Okay, well, in that case, we'll move no, on. Uh, I'm here. I'm oh, here. Mike, excellent. Thank you. Yes. So, uh, yes. Mike, over to you. Thank you. Here I am in Nairobi, a few miles away from Michael uh, Hopkins. Um, I've lived here in Kenya since 1977. These days I'm a director and a consultant. And um, while Guy has been talking at the global, at the macro level with the um, multi-billionaires and the, uh, the, the top tech companies and, and farmers, I'd like to give a more of a micro view from a developing country, um, Kenya, about my personal experiences on trust and responsible leadership during this crisis. And uh, good news for Michael Hopkins, I'm, I'm going to be more positive than Guy was, although I fully um, uh, understand Guy's thesis and I'm not disputing it. Although like Michael, um, I would like to hear more about ways in which the precariat, um, maybe since I'm also not part of that top 1%, I'm part of the precariat, what we can be doing more. And of course in Kenya, uh, some of us are doing some things. But among my experiences, I want to talk just a little bit illustratively about where I'm a chairman and, and director of different companies and where I'm a consultant. Um, and, and how it's been going in these days of uh, Zoom relationships. Uh, I'm happy to say that where I'm a director and where I'm being doing consulting in the last few weeks, um, they are all, without exceptions, organizations of high trust cultures. We do have, despite the whole justified reputation for corruption, uh, in Kenya, uh, we do have a lot of very healthy subcultures as role model for responsible leadership. And what I've been seeing uh, with these organizations during the time of the crisis is that, of course, they built up their trust way before. And it is the values of the founders, of the directors, of the senior management, and how they view 
uh, the, the stakeholders around them with compassion, with fairness, and uh, with respect. So what I've been seeing is that uh, leaders in these organizations uh, th that I have been exposed to have been communicating really well and more intensively. They've been consulting more with their people. They've been building consensus with them in a flattened um, group of pyramids. Uh, they have been uh, exchanging offers and requests, coming to terms with who has to sacrifice what and who has to sacrifice what in the short term in order to build sustainability in the longer term. What I'm seeing, and people are telling me too, directors, managers, others, is that they're actually in closer contact with each other. I talk more as a director and a consultant to my colleagues, to my clients, than I was doing when I was meeting them in person before, struggling through traffic or battering my way through airports. We are better informed about what's going on. We know each other more intimately. There's more delegation and empowerment, and it has stimulated more surprising and accelerated innovation and including from some unexpected quarters, even as, of course, there have been disappointments. Also, in the organizations where I'm involved, and it's sometimes uh, for profits, and it's sometimes um, NGOs and, and education institutions, different uh, spectrum, these organizations all along have said no to dealing with untrustworthy customers, suppliers, and other stakeholders, uh, even when that saying no, of course, does mean you lose out on a good deal or revenue because you're holding back from the unsus more unsustainable future. The other thing about all these organizations being more switched on is that they have done more digitizing in the years leading up to where we are now. Kenya generally is a country of amazingly high IT literacy and connectivity. We're of course the global pioneers of mobile money and iBanking uh, predominates. And so things like cashless transactions and the dying use of checks is uh, a way of reducing the potential for untrustworthiness and the ability to track um, uh, how people are doing business. So Kenyans are renowned for energy and innovativeness, including in how to be corrupt. But um, in the private sector, this digitization has greatly, of course, accelerated during COVID. And I just want to end on this note of digitization because it's so important in generating the transparency and accountability that enforces trustworthiness. I want to quote Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella, who claimed in a recent interview that um, his company has gone through two years worth of digitization in two months. And um, maybe much as we worry with Guy about many aspects of automation and its disruptive effect, um, it also, as he too said, um, has led to uh, much more um, opportunity as well and uh, trustworthiness because people can't do things under the table. Guy, you talked about the need for intellectual uh, leadership. I, in all my work, I'm very focused on emotional intelligence alongside the intellectual intelligence. And I think that if the precariat is to get its hour act together in moving society forward within communities, within countries, regions, and globally, we also need the emotional intelligence to get that critical mass to move away from Guy's very sad but not unrealistic scenario. So thank you from Kenya. And uh, let's hear from more 
optimists and pessimists from their experiences and predictions. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you. I would now, because of the time, we haven't got very much time left, and we obviously would like to a couple of questions that you know that are going to be given to Guy to respond. We also need to hear from um, Dr. Anthony and uh, my Professor Mike Sachs. So, um, please, could I pass over now to Dr. Anto? Um, are you there? Hello. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank um, the Institute of Responsible Leadership and UNITA to uh, let me share some of my views uh, on a small contribution on responsible leadership in, term, in times of disruption, just like the COVID. Um, my, my slides are more kind of theoretical, <laughs> but I would like to share the view from the other side, which is the, what you call precariat. Um, after 30 over years, maybe 40 years living in the West and trying to integrate into the society in the West uh, with a luggage uh, when I came here with five languages, I just noticed that um, certain things that the West take for granted is still at the beginning of uh, people who have done what you have um, um, rec recommended that is uh, basic income, social benefits, uh, um, equal rights, and so on uh, in, in my world, which is Vietnam. So, uh, coming back to um, to these um, trust in social contract theories and CSR, um, I found some solutions that is maybe applicable to people who are in search of uh, some some ways of um, getting out of poverty, and um, one of the one of the um, um, of the, the dreams of the youth in, in Vietnam, for example, is to have a, just a peaceful life with a, a small family, uh, some basic freedom, uh, freedom of work, um, freedom of studies, even the freedom to learn English. So this is a very basic things. And the social theories aim to confirm that the relationship of the state versus citizens must be based on trust and equity to bring peace, harmony, prosperity, and sustainability. Those vocabularies are, are the terms that I have learned and spent years to understand for each of them. So for me, it resonates a lot. Uh, when we talk about peace, when we talk about sustainability, um, we know about harmony because we're, we are basically coming from the Buddhist uh, philosophy and then harmony in society is very important. For business, um, because my, uh, my doctorate degree is on uh, restructuring state-owned enterprises in Vietnam, and that comes from the general um, disappointment of a lot of uh, Vietnamese after the, after the peace. We have been in peace for 50 years and we're still struggling with uh, equal inequality and maybe much more than before the war. And um, one of the, the theories was on uh, corporate uh, governance and the CSR. So um, the CSR recommend good governance based on competent and responsible leadership to maintain the market confidence. And so um, for, for um, I'm working now um, at Globe Ethics as a project, uh, a program executive in, in, in ethics education. And uh, it's very difficult um, for, my, um, for, my, um, for my director, who is a professor at Stückelberger, to try to get the ethics in China for so many years, and he didn't manage to get it. 
because there was some 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 uh, resistance at, at the word ethical but actually uh, this year we uh, we found um, a way to uh, to work with the vietnamese state universities by talking about capacity building and how people interpret the responsibility uh, the word responsibility and and so suddenly we we found out that ethics is actually a responsibility so uh, we start to use that to start a, a dialogue with um, with the Vietnamese and we are now building together a program for capacity building for future leaders with the university is in water resource management and identifying the the problems that are resulting from bad management, but also maybe bad vision and incompetent leadership that has been running in, in that part of the world. Uh, the next okay, uh, Dr. Anto, um, I am very aware that you possibly have another slide. We haven't got very much time left for yeah. questions and Professor Mike's Ma yeah. yeah. summary. So if I could just ask you to finish up in another minute, that would be great. Yeah. Can I have the last slide, please? So uh, apart from the trust that I, uh, I, I, I think it is necessary for, for both the state and the business is first on the, 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 uh, the level of the citizens, of the taxpayers, and the trust of international opinion for the state or the, go uh, the, the corporate governance um, at the le level of the state and on the um, on the trust uh, for for businesses is about the trust of investors, the trust of workers, and the trust of the market to be, to build brand loyalty and reputation. So the last slide is actually the positive externalities that is created by the state by a legal framework to inspire trust. And when there is trust, there is hope. And that's what I have uh, noticed, even in the, in, in the worst times of um, the Vietnamese, um, uh, my young days, where my first um, meal was at seven o'clock in the evening, where um, my only asset is a mosquito net. Uh, and with uh, five languages, I earn one dollar a month. I was still very happy. So basically, that is my message to uh, anybody who wants to hear it. Uh, sometimes we are faced with fear of uncertainty and sometimes we are faced with too much of thinking but sometimes if we come back to the to to the real values which is uh, humanity love responsibility and and um, building ourselves from inner from the inner side to um, to um, to to um, uh, to uh, value what you have uh, and that's what we are doing is to work with universities business schools research centers and so on to build a curriculum that address problems like cyber ethics uh, criminal cyber crim criminalities lack of uh, leadership and the corporate social responsibility of the state as a corporation but also of businesses as um provider of jobs thank you for your attention okay thank you thank you very much dr anto um so just we have six minutes left for um professor mike sachs to say a few words please and for guy standing to respond to the uh, few questions i have about who are the responsible leaders and what immediate actions can we be taken taken for personal Respons responsibility and other questions that I have through we may have to address uh, via email at another time. Thank you, Professor Mike Sachs. And I'd ask you also to sum up at the end after Professor Guy Standing. Thank you. Uh, Professor Mike Sachs, I, I, are you on mute? Yeah, I'm just unmuting. It seems to be going on a kind of, uh, <laughs> right. uh, kind of uh, up and down uh, 
trajectory. Yeah, I was saying, guys, the guys' presentation is always, you know, absolutely fascinating. And, uh, you know, they may be a bit depressing, but they're, but they're real. And uh, I would like to sort of just try and pull together some of the threads, perhaps in my, my questions to Guy, because, you know, I, I think that uh, the issue of change and how we get change is a really fundamental one um, in terms of the scenario you paint. And um, I am sort of drawn back to some of the thoughts um, of Ralph Miliband, who you may already have met Guy, but, um, you know, who's the father of David and Ed Miliband, who talked about the proletariat rather than the precariat and saw it as a kind of battle between David and Goliath. And I really wonder, on the scenario that you're painting, it, it, it take, brings back images of a kind of mass society where, you, like in totalitarian society, you have the elite at the top and atomized individuals at the bottom, with the atomized individuals hopefully coming together to overthrow the elite or to, to rectify some of the balances. And I think that um, certainly with Mike's comments about um, you know, some of the groups which are going in Kenya, uh, the intermediary groups, with Michael's comments about this kind of corporations and you know, there is a middle layer there when the middle layer should also be something which in my view you know, should be utilized as a point of leverage in affecting change rather than just simply uh, you know, relying on an atomized population of, of young leaders who, you know, who, impressive as they are, you know, they may not quite be able to do it any more than I think that ethics, you know, going back to Anto, um, you know, ethics itself may not change society. We need the points of leverage. We need to look at strategic alliances and how effective these can be. So in my slide, which I'd be grateful if Sebastian could bring up, I would like to talk about professions because I see professions as another intermediary group that could exert um, tremendous um, potential leverage in this political situation. And uh, I'm a great professions buff, buff amongst other things and I have my forthcoming book next year on professions, a key idea for business and society, just to give that a plug, which is book number 22, but you know, it's one that I'm really excited about because Professions used to be seen as a trusted focus for responsible leadership to, to, to cut to the chase, as it were, with their expertise and codes of ethics. However, they've come somewhat into disrepute because we're sort of probably all aware of cases like, you know, Dr. Harold Shipman, who's, uh, who bumped off at least 200 plus of his uh, patients, uh, probably a lot more. Um, and um, also the role that auditors and accountants played in uh, you know kind of facilitating the 2008 economic collapse with all of the negative implications which is carried. Um, I think the professions are currently having to adapt um, particularly in the neoliberal societies in face of consumer lobbies in face of policy reform that they're, they're being pushed to become more collaborative more accountable more public service oriented and I think we need a resurrection of that trust in professions. We need checks and balances to keep them on the, on the, on the, on the path <laughs> of positivity in terms of moving forward. And this is particularly true in the case of COVID-19, because it's very interesting that governments, and particularly the UK government, if I take as an example, say, oh, we're following science. We're actually, you know, we're doing what the scientists tell us. In fact, they're not. They're making a political judgment. Um, based on the science that they choose to take forward, rather than that which um, necessarily would, would give them stellar, stellar advice. But nonetheless, this does indicate that, as in the case of teachers too, you know, in terms of potential education reforms, getting children back to school, we, we are very dependent on the views of professions. And the views of professions do have a substantive impact on what happens in the world. And so, I suppose really I just end with a plea guy that perhaps you bring some of these intermediate groups, including professions, including, um, if you like, um, corporations, including, um, you know, sort of social groups, social networks that uh, Mike was alluding to, so that we can begin to create a more ethical society as a platform for introducing basic income and as a platform for um, implementing some of the ideas that Anne Tho has also, um, has also very much um, expounded um, at this meeting today. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And um, Professor Guy Standing, I wonder if you could just sort of respond with a couple of those. Please bear in mind we uh, the time and also we will be able to respond to people. They will have the presentation and, and emails later on. Um, and then I would ask when you've responded to those, if Professor Mike Sachs could say a few words. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm just beginning Mike Sachs' uh, last point. As it happens, Mike, the biggest book and the book that I regard as my best is about precisely dealing with professions and occupational citizenship and the need to reverse the new reforms over the past 30 years. What we've seen is a, is a dismantling of the guild traditions of the occupations and a shift to state licensing. And state licensing has been a cause of the fragmentation of professions into elites, a salariat, and a precariat group. It goes through all the professions. You now have a, gro a growing precariat, but we can discuss that separately. I think what I want to respond to in the couple of minutes I've got is that the desire for a solution required a different lecture. I have written a book called The Precariat Charter, mm -hmm. in which I wrote a 29-item uh, manifesto for what the precariat wants. And one of the fundamental things, and I know you, Mike uh, Sachs, know about this, is I believe we need to see a revival of the commons. A revival mm -hmm. of yeah. our, our commons and the traditions of commoning and sharing in society. And corporations and all institutions have a role, have roles to play in that revival of the commons. And it's been quite interesting that I get invited to speak to corporate groups to the City of London on the Commons and the need to do it. And I've also written a book called The Precariat Charter, which has, which has a whole series of, of, of items and the revival of the Commons has a charter for the Commons. So for these, there are solutions. And I, I think that basic income is an essential, but it's not a panacea. And I've had the privilege to conduct pilots of basic income in India, in Namibia, in, in, in been involved in Finland, in Canada, and so on. And I know that it results in an empowerment, a reduction of stress, an increase in work, an increase in welfare, an increase in the status of women, and it induces leadership at local levels. I think that is a, one of the most powerful lessons I've gained from doing pilots where we provided thousands of people. And as for, for Mike Eldon's uh, points, I, I think he knows that I was invited to launch, uh, give the inaugural launching speech of the Kenyan basic income network in Kisumu earlier this year before the lockdown in February. And I was absolutely staggered by the enormous number of people there who were supporting basic income. And now the network has an incredible 87,000 members. Now, when you have a membership driven body that is showing leaders leadership, then I think that is a fantastic, fantastic indicator of the potential energy out there. As for Mike's point about corporations and stakeholder capitalism, of course we need corporations but they've got to change in character. They've got to go back to the basics of focusing on the production of goods and services and not rent seeking. And that means we have to focus a lot on dismantling the ridiculous intellectual property rights system where a company buys up a patent and then has 40 years of total monopolistic profits where it blocks other people from producing, it blocks other corporations, and it, it, it takes all the rental income. Stakeholder capitalism sounds great, but if you have a stakeholder capitalism which allows all the groups in a particular corporation to share out the rent and therefore continue to lobby and, and fight for that rent, 
and you're not solving the problem. The real problem is we have rentier capitalism and that must be dismantled. It is ridiculous that we have a tiny number of corporations able to extract vast proportion of the total income and profits being generated. That is not going to be solved by stakeholder capitalism, giving a voice to consumers, giving a voice. Of course I support that. I don't want to dismiss it, but I don't think it's dealing with the structural problems that is requiring political leadership. It's requiring intellectual leadership. And the last point I want to make is one of the most vital concerns I have, and we should all have, is the commodification of education. The loss of leadership capacity because the education institutions of the world are being converted to human capital forming uh, bodies that focus entirely on preparing people for jobs and for making money, where we're seeing an absence of the civics of leadership, the civics of being a citizen, and our own history and culture being marginalized because they don't help you make money. We've got that we've got to have a strategy for getting intellectual leadership back into our universities and colleges. And that is one of the structural challenges of our age. I have other things, but I apologize. I will have to stop here because we've run out of time. But if anybody has any particular questions, feel free to, to send me an email. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, Professor Mike Sachs, would you like to finish the presentation? You need to unmute, unmute your... <laughs> okay, yes. Well, well, thank you for just giving me a moment or two just to, just to bring things together. Um, as, I've, as I've indicated before, I mean, Guy's presentations are always stimulating. They're always thought-provoking. And um, clearly, I'm sure the hope of everyone who's in, been engaged in this session uh, is very much that we can affect some change for the very powerful agendas that he produces. And I think that one of the most powerful aspects of Guy's response and indeed his work generally is the way in which, um, you know, the basic income agenda, the precarious agenda, the plundering of the commons, the way in which these interlock in terms of the, the, the fit between them and the synergies between them in terms of being a tremendously powerful critique of, of where we are at the moment. And uh, the, the hope is for all of us, I'm sure, that we can affect um, significant change. And I would like to thank um, all of our panelists um, for you know, tremendously um, helpful comments and questions which they've posed to Guy, to which he's given um, a powerful response, may I say. And I would also like to thank um, very much um, Sebastian for facilitating this and Ju Julie as Julia as well and uh, and of course uh, our chair Julie who has um, kept us all to time which is a magnificent achievement um, and uh, of course Alex Ameya who has introduced the session um, so effectively by giving us that devastating background about COVID-19 and where we are and whether this is actually just something that's been precipitated by the wider wider context, the uh, socio-political context that Guy has outlined, or whether it's significant so right. I think we can all agree that uh, there is going to be a very significant economic backlash that we all need to be very much aware of, and the economic backlash could kill a lot more people in terms of unemployment, in terms of precarity, than the actual disease itself. So um, with those thoughts, not wanting to be too depressing, um, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you to all the participants who've been involved. And I hope you've um, enjoyed and been stimulated this about this um, session as much as I have. Thank you very much. Thank you.